Hello everyone, welcome to session four of LTech 651. In today's video, I want to discuss the various problems e-learning companies are trying to solve. Then we're going to review various multimedia authoring approaches. We'll examine the flexibility usability trade-off and we'll introduce an open source framework for authoring interactive HTML5 content. So let me begin, as I always do, by saying thank you for your Critical Reflection 3 videos. Obviously, the purpose of that assignment was to analyze and evaluate existing multimedia authoring tools. We focused on Articulate 360. We examined Easy Generator. We examined Gomo Learning. We examined Lectora. Thank you, Joseph. And we took a look at Smart Builder. These are some of the more popular and more powerful programs out there for multimedia authoring. There are two other big players that we didn't take a look at, and that includes Adobe's Captivate as well as iSpring's iSpring Suite. One of the reasons I wanted you to take a look at those is so you know what's happening out there in the industry. And as you can see here, there are so many different multimedia authoring platforms and tools. So the question may come up, well, why are there so many competing multimedia authoring tools? Well, the reason is we know that multimedia is effective for learning when it's designed with intention and with human cognitive architecture in mind. But I want to point out that designing interactive multimedia is a non-trivial task. And these companies are trying to solve multiple problems. So let's take a look at some of those problems. Number one, they're trying to support content for any age, subject, and or level of expertise. Number two, they're acknowledging the value of visual design in terms of colors, layout, hierarchy, font type, so on and so forth. They're providing access to existing design assets, so you don't have to create everything from scratch, such as pictures, icons, videos, and sounds. There's usually some way to program interactivity and include assessment opportunities in the multimedia instructional messages. There's also efforts to facilitate the design process through collaboration and review mechanisms. There's also efforts to host online content so that actually after you create something, you can host it on their platform. They're trying to accommodate multiple target platforms. Not everyone is going to watch content online. So you might be publishing content for Windows or Mac, for web, for mobile, so on and so forth. And then finally, these companies are trying to adhere to standards so that multimedia projects are interoperable and can work in multiple contexts. So one of the things I want you to think about is which of this list of problems, and we could probably come up with a few more if we thought about it a little bit more, but which of these problems does the tool you reviewed try to solve. Many of them are trying to do all of these things, or at least a good portion of them. And that's some of the reason why these tools, are, A, are not perfect because they're very complicated, and B, they're quite expensive because these companies are trying to solve all these problems. Now, what I want to do is talk a little bit about an older study about structured multimedia authoring. And this is by Butlerman and Hardman. It's from 2005, actually. But they argued that an authoring system allows the presentation creator to develop a narrative structure based on a collection of media assets and a creative intent that manages the presentation's visual and temporal flow. Now, they distinguished an authoring system from an authoring paradigm, which refers to the way the system presents the underlying document structure to the author. In their analysis of different multimedia authoring programs, they identified that the task of authoring has a number of requirements. It requires the collection and generation of source material. It requires the placement of those sources within the presentation environment. It requires the ability to style text and spatial layouts. It requires the incorporation of higher level structures such as chapters or sections. And it requires the integration of several types of information into a composite presentation. Think there your multimedia principle of having text and images or even audio narration. And then finally, 
the task of authoring multimedia requires, ideally, the ability to dictate the spatial and temporal relationships between all of those assets. So those are some of the requirements of modern multimedia authoring tools. Now, Butlerman and colleagues also talked about dominant authoring approaches. You can think of these as being related to the authoring paradigm. In other words, the way the system presents the underlying multimedia document structure to the author. One of the dominant authoring approaches is structure-based paradigm. And this is a paradigm you can see a screenshot here that usually really uses kind of a hierarchy or a document tree. And in this way, the author gets to define which media assets are included and when they get activated in the presentation. PowerPoint is kind of an example of a structure-based paradigm. Another authoring paradigm is timeline-based. And this is using an explicit temporal scale, the timeline, as a common activation reference for all media objects. You could think of this as a virtual videotape model for authoring, in which only the relative ordering is emphasized. So tools like Camtasia use a timeline-based paradigm. The third paradigm is a graph-based paradigm, and this paradigm uses flowcharts or directed graphs to characterize the activation and synchronization of various multimedia assets. In other words, when things appear, for how long, and whether or not there is any interactivity. And the fourth paradigm is the script-based paradigm. And this one's unique in that it doesn't rely on a visual interface. Instead, it uses code or a procedural representation to specify the behavior of the presentation. Now, what's interesting about this, although it's the least user-friendly, it provides nearly unlimited control over synchronous and asynchronous behavior of the multimedia assets. Those are some interesting aspects to multimedia authoring that I want you to be keeping in mind as you think about various authoring tools that are out there today. Okay, what I want to do now is shift to examining what I call the flexibility usability trade-off. And of course, this week we learned about some e-learning or multimedia authoring tools that are out there. And what did we learn about these? Well, we learned that authoring tools are software for creating and arranging content or media into a standardized structure so that it can be exported and shared in different ways. Now, I want you to think about multimedia authoring tools as falling along a continuum. So on one side of that continuum, we have dedicated design and development tools. And these are tools that are super flexible. You can build things in kind of a piecemeal approach, but they require specific and varied expertise, and they are much harder to learn. The trade-off, of course, is that you can build just about anything that you could imagine, from complex video games and simulations to just your basic interactive presentation. The dedicated design and development tools will allow you to produce any type of interactive multimedia. Now, on the other side, we have integrated design and development tools. And these are tools that are built to be authoring tools for multimedia, but they're less flexible. They're less flexible because they're trying to create this kind of all-in-one approach. They're trying to give you everything that you need to be successful in authoring some simple interactive multimedia. You could think of these as kind of do-it-yourself packages or jack-of-all-trades packages. And the advantage to these is because you have everything in one tool or one environment, they're easier to learn. The downside is they're less customizable, they're less flexible, and so creating something very specific for a certain type of content in a specific target audience, you may not be able to create that in the way that you want. And so what we could see here in terms of this authoring tool continuum is there's a flexibility usability trade-off. As the flexibility of the system increases, the usability of the system decreases. In other words, it gets harder to use. And so depending on where you want to be on this continuum and the technical skills that you have, that's going to determine what set of tools that you will look at. Now, in a college of education, of course, most students are only going to take a course or two related to multimedia development, so we're not expecting you to become experts. 
Because of that, we want to look at some tools that are a little bit easier to use, more off-the-shelf products. So with that in mind, I want to talk to you about H5P. Now, H5P stands for HTML5, the, the latest protocol for HTML, and it stands for HTML5 package. And this is a free and open source content collaboration framework that's based on JavaScript. And the aim of the H5P project is to make it easy to create, share, and reuse interactive HTML5 content. In other words, it's really for making interactive multimedia that's really easy to share and use on the web. Now, we're going to be learning about H5P this week, and I want to make a distinction between H5P.org and H5P.com. H5P.org is the organization organization that is charged with developing this free and open source content collaboration framework. And because it's free and open source, developers from around the world are working on this and contributing to this environment. And I want to encourage you to go to h5p.org and experiment with the different examples and read the documentation related to H5P. Now, importantly, because H5P is HTML5, it's made for the web. And that means that anything that's created with H5P needs to be hosted somewhere on a server. Now, because of that, H5P.org is where all of this content is developed. It's not made for hosting the world's H5P content that people develop. And that's where H5P.com comes into play. So you can see in the title there, it says H5P as a service. H5P.com is offering the H5P software, this content collaboration framework as a service. In other words, you can pay some money to h5p.com in order for them to host and serve the interactive HTML5 content that you develop based on h5p. So there's really two parts to it. There's the group that's creating this collaboration framework and all of its tools, and then there's another group you can pay to host it. Now, of course, if you run your own server or know someone who does, you do not have to pay to use H5P as a service. And, and we'll talk more about that in just a couple of minutes. So what types of content can you create with H5P? Well, it's constantly changing, but here is a sampling of some of the interactive content you can create. You can create accordions. You can create quizzes. You can create images with hotspots. You can create branching scenarios, interactive timelines, so on and so forth. And we'll be looking at some of these examples up close in just a minute. Now, this is an example of one type of H5P content. It's called a course presentation. And let's take a look at the pieces of this course presentation. So here, highlighted in green, is the main view of the course presentation. And you can see here, just like any presentation software, that it actually has text. Some of the text has bullets and some of its title text. And then, of course, it also has an image. And then it says you can jump to the red current. So it also has links and hotspots in it. If we look down below that with this area highlighted in green, you can see here there are 10 slides in this course presentation. And if I was to click on any of those, I could jump to that slide. The slides with the circle on them indicate that there's some sort of interactive component that the user needs to interact with. And then down below that, we can see that we're on the first slide, one of 10, and that happens to be named Cloudberries. I can also expand this presentation to make it go full screen, and I could even print this presentation if I wanted to. Now, down at the very bottom of this section, you can see a couple of important things here. Let's read this from left to right. So you can see there is a reuse icon, and if you were to click that, that would allow you to download the code related to this course presentation, and you could remix it and redo it and upload it somewhere else. 
So part of H5P is to make reusable, shareable content. That's part of the open source mindset. As authors of H5P, we can also set the rights or the copyright protection. And we'll take a look at some of the options related to that. And then most importantly, take a look at the third item, which says embed. And what's important about H5P is it's designed to be embedded in other web pages. And that could be a WordPress web page. It could be a web page on your own personal website. It could be a web page in Canvas or in Moodle or in Laulima. And so all this content is designed to work with internet technologies and seamlessly embed. And that's the power of the H5P interactive content. And we'll be taking a look at that in a couple of minutes. I did want to point out that there is a tool called Lumi and you can find it at lumi.education. And this is actually a standalone H5P content editor and it's available cross-platform for Windows, Mac, and Linux. So you might wanna check this out. And the idea is you run some software locally on your computer that allows you to create H5P content and edit it. Keep in mind though, however, that once you edit that content and you finalize it, you need to export it as HTML and then upload it to a server somewhere. Because remember, because it's HTML content, it needs to be on a web server somewhere in order for other people to be able to interact with it and access it. Okay, now fortunately, we have at the College of Education, we have our own copy of H5P hosted on a college-wide server. And so you can see here, this is H5P and it's embedded in a WordPress installation. In this week's hands-on tutorial, be showing you how to log in to H5P hosted by the College of Education, and we're actually going to build some content using this interface. Okay, everyone, we're out of time for today. Have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.